Hi, lovely to have you here. Welcome to the Electro Revolution channel. My name is Michael and I'm a car and tech enthusiast. In today's episode, we're going to go through the Australian Public EV Charging Network. And the reason we're doing this, well, there's a couple of reasons actually. Number one, Tesla. They've released a 20 stall charging station in Goulburn, New South Wales, the biggest in Australia and the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. And number two, the Managing Director of Polestar. He announced now is the time for Australia to have EV charging standards. And of course, if you remember the BYD 2000 kilometer road trip, the series I released there, I think it was seven episodes overall. Episodes four, five, and six was the return trip from Phillip Island, Victoria, back home to Sydney, New South Wales. Almost 1,000 kilometer road trip. And if you remember, or if you've watched those episodes, you'll know I had some challenges coming back. So what we're going to look at here is what we have in Australia and maybe some opportunities to fix what we have or improve what we have in Australia. So I hope you enjoy this episode. The most noteworthy announcement that Tesla has made in recent times is the opening of this 20 stall charging site in Goulburn, New South Wales. It's huge, it's massive, and it's the biggest that we've got, as I said in the welcoming message. It's the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, Tesla themselves, they have all of them open for all third party vehicles. It's not just for Tesla vehicles. Now, if you know with Tesla, sometimes they release stalls that are specific to Tesla and they may be version two stalls. They could be different version stalls. This 20 stall system is a version four system that's open to all vehicles, not just Tesla. Now, if you're a Tesla owner, you can charge there at 52 cents a kilowatt. If you're a non-Tesla owner, you can charge there at 73 cents a kilowatt. And of course they have the third option where if you're a member, a charging member, I think it's $10 a month for that, then you do get a discount at the kilowatt uh, charge. But they're all CCS2 compatible uh, charges. So as long as your vehicle is CCS2 compatible, you'll be able to charge at this Tesla site. Tesla released statistics about their uptime of their supercharging network globally uh, every year. In 2023, that figure was 99.97% uptime. And what that essentially means is at every single site they have worldwide, at least half of the stalls were functional and active and could be used. And that's an incredible figure. In 2024, it went down a little bit it went to 99.95% uptime, but that's still an exceptional figure. Unfortunately, Tesla don't release publicly how they perform within each country and in, like Australia. So we can't really drill down and find out how the Tesla supercharging network performs here. But we can assume that it performs, generally speaking, similar to the way the global results perform. Now, there has been a study about our public EV charging network within Australia and in that study, it was found 13% were unavailable. And of that 13%, nine were under repair and four were specified as coming soon. So generally speaking, we don't really perform that well in the EV public charging network within Australia. And that can be backed up by things that people say in forums, in Reddit, and in things like that, even in my experience. Now, if you looked at some of the road trip videos I made, the BYD 2000 kilometer road trip, I didn't have a problem going up in the first three episodes. I only had the problem coming back. And in the seventh episode, I gave a number of points as to how I can improve the return trip. And one of those, one of the big mistakes I made was actually disabling the Tesla network. And I gave my reasons for why I did that initially, but I learned my lesson. The next time I'm going to take a, a long road trip like that, I will not disable the Tesla charging network because that's actually still the best network in Australia. And globally speaking, it's still the best network globally. Now to compare with the next biggest provider, EV Networks, EVIE, across Australia, their co-founder in 2023 mentioned that 
uh, the reliability of their network was at 90% with a 10% downtime, which if when you compare to Tesla, it's, it's considerably a lot lower. And they said at the time, well, this gentleman said at the time, they were aiming for a 95% reliability rating. One of the interesting things about EV networks is they do receive government funding. Now, of course, other suppliers also receive government funding, but I'm just gonna focus on this for a little bit. In, uh, uh, from the 1st of January, 2024, they received government funding. Now, because it's from the government, there are usually strings attached. And in this case, they were meant to supply a 98% uptime of all the charges that were government funded. So that excludes the charges that EV themselves own, but the ones that were specifically government funded came with strings. And that was measured and that was enforced by the government on EV. So the point I'm trying to make here is for the EV charges in the EV network, the government funded EV charges, they need to be 98% or above. For the non-government funded EV charges, they can be anything, but typically they're under the 98%. So when you look at the overall EV charging network, it's anywhere from two to 10% unreliability. Now, that's a key point to remember about the next topic we're going to talk about. Now, this brings us to our next point. In EV Central, which is a new site, they reported on uh, Scott Maynard. He's the Managing Director of Pulsar Australia. Now, he criticised the lack of legislative control over charging networks within Australia, and he compared it to uh, the UK. Now, in the UK, they got legislation which forces the uh, charging networks within the country to be at a 99% and above uptime, and for all of them to publicly report their uptime unlike we, we, what we do in Australia, where there's actually no legislation to force companies to do that. And he also said that with that legislative requirement, that'll force the networks to actually improve their customer service, to actually improve their charges, to maintain them, so they do meet that reliability uptime. And of course, that's better for everyone as a whole. It'll reduce the, uh, uh, what they call trash talk in the social media. It'll reduce people complaining on sites like Reddit and things like that. So it improves the confidence of the charging network within Australia. Now I can relate to something like that. If you remember in the road trip videos I released for the BYD 2000 kilometer road trip, on the way back, there was uh, number one, a BP Pulse that I went to, which was completely flat out busy. So for that type of supercharging site, they needed more charges. But then I approached an EV charging one, and I forgot exactly which, um, uh, which uh, area it was in, but I approached an EV charging one and it was broken for three days, and it didn't say it in the app. And when I went there, I tried it a few times until I rang EV support, which they were very helpful, but they noted that it was actually reported three days ago and I didn't actually put the faulty uh, unit within the app. So I shouldn't have even gone there. So I guess this is the key that Scott Maynard is addressing with uh, recommending a legislative uh, requirement on charging networks within Australia to compare it with um, the way they do it in the UK and the reason why they have such a good quality charging system within the UK. Now, if we look at a comparison between the charging networks between Australia and the UK, Australia has about two and a half thousand public charges and of those, about 120 are ultra-fast chargers. In the UK, they have about 24,000 public chargers, and of those, about 1,600 are the ultra-fast chargers. So it's obvious to see that there is a major difference between the charging network in Australia and the charging network in the UK. But that's not to say nothing has been happening or being planned in Australia. Like in 2023, there was a paper for the national EV strategy and minimum standards. And there was discussions about, uh, you know, how to best implement a charging network within Australia, how better collaboration between charging networks and various things like that. Now, just to cover a few points there, mandatory interoperability, that was one of them. And essentially what that means is that uh, 
whichever charger you go to on whatever vehicle you go to that you can essentially just plug in and start charging. The second one, uniform accessibility and payments. Now, if you've watched, <laughs> if you've watched episode seven of the BYD 2000 kilometer road trip, that's one of the points I raised. We've got so many applications here in Australia. There's at least, I think, 30 applications when I researched it uh, for the different networks. And each one requires an app installation on your phone, uh, credit card payment or debit card payment details within the application, and then scanning of QR code. It's not like that in the UK. The UK just swipes one credit card or one debit card. You just swipe on any machine, doesn't matter the network provider, and you've got straight access to the charging network. And the third point that was raised in that was uh, more user-friendly charges and more transparency between the planning systems for each of the charging networks. So communicate with each other, talk to each other so they know where demand is and to install further charges where the demand is located. So we're going to sum up some of these details. Number one, what we should understand is between 2022 and 2025 in Australia, the public charging has increased by 121%. Yet, the number of EVs has surged by 675%. And that leaves essentially fewer public charges per EV. And that's unlike the leading international markets like the UK. Forecasts suggest that in Australia, it needs at least an eightfold increase in public charging capacity, which is about 27,500 new charges by 2023, and that's to meet the demand of the current EV vehicles and the EV consumer market. So to summarize what we're talking about here in this video, and please leave your comments if you've got any uh, points you'd like to raise that things I've missed or anything like that. But in summary, what we're talking about here and the issues highlighted by that managing director of Polestar and some other industry uh, experts. Number one, the lack of mandated uptime of performance standards in Australia. Now, of course, as I mentioned, there is a national strategy that's under development and that's uh, to uh, supply minimum standards. They're emerging, but it's not happening fast enough. Number two, the lower number of public charges versus ultra fast charges. Now, you know, from the road trip videos I took, there's plenty of low end charges, but when you're on a road trip, you want, you want to have the minimum time possible at a charger so you can continue your trip. Because if you know, I provided the statistics of uh, the trips, both for up and back from Sydney, New South Wales to Phillip Island in Victoria. Overall, my time from when leaving my home to go to Phillip Island, Victoria was 15 hours. And of that, there was a couple of hours in charging time. And of course, during that charging time, there's, you know, a rest stop. So you'd have, you know, your toilet break, your meal break, your rest break, that sort of stuff. But what we're talking about here is the low number of ultra fast charges. Now, of course, there's a government response to that. Again, it's emerging infrastructure expansion underway, but lagging EV uptake. And that's the percentages I presented earlier. And the last but not least, is the rising negative user experiences. Now, even I had to admit on the return trip as one of my recommendations, and again, primarily because I disabled the Tesla charging network, I advised and I recommended that for long trips that are very regular, it's better to take a hybrid vehicle because petrol stations are always there, they're always available, and that's today. It may not be like that in another five or 10 years, but today I recommended hybrid vehicles for those longer trips if they're regular. That's not to say, of course, as I mentioned in that video, I will never take the uh, uh, BYD seal on a long trip again. Of course I will, but I will be planning better and I'll be planning different uh, charging stops if I know that potentially on a, on a busy time that there'll be a busy charger, that's the ultra fast charger. I will look up backup charges that I can go to if there's a public charger that's busy. Now it's time to share some thoughts. Now, for me personally, I remember reading, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, the New South Wales government was investing $41 million into hundreds of new ultra fast chargers with a minimum of four stations each. And of course, going up to eight and 10 and 12 stations. Now, not all of that money was 
uh, from the New South Wales government. I think 16 million of that was from the New South Wales government and other uh, money was provided by private investment. But nevertheless, $41 million invested in New South Wales. When I look at Victoria or Queensland, they're not ahead in uh, their EV charging networks as we are. Now, when the New South Wales government can invest money like that, why can't the other governments? This video is related more to a national perspective, but I'm just giving an example of what we're doing here in New South Wales. And we can use these extra charges because the biggest states we have in Australia are uh, New South Wales and Victoria. That's not to say anything against other states, it's just in terms of population and the size of our states like brisbane or queensland i should say is a massive state yet they're not as uh, receptive to uh, ev charging networks and policies and things like we are in new south wales or like even victoria to some extent so what do you think of this uh, planned legislation the requirement that uh, the government get involved in the charging networks I think it's a critical service personally for uh, vehicle owners because let's take for example in history when someone would buy a car and they couldn't use a fuel station for it or they would have to drive many kilometers or you know half an hour one hour to a petrol station it just would not be acceptable and that's the same thing I think now that we've moved on to greener energy and that's not going to stop it's going to continue and with this greener energy means more charging stations because uh, more and more people are buying more and more EV vehicles. They're becoming many, much more affordable and mostly on parity with ICE vehicles now. So anyway, what are your thoughts? And I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share this content with someone who'd love it and leave us a comment, even just to say thank you. I hope to see you on the next episode or the next series. Until then, bye for now.